you have your Bibles tonight, and if you don't have your Bibles, just take a copy of the scriptures that are provided uh, there in front of you and turn with me tonight to Genesis chapter 19. We saw last week in Genesis 18, Abraham demonstrates a great spirit of holy boldness as he stood uh, before the Lord Jesus Christ interceding on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. We see him standing uh, there as uh, a mediator between life and death, praying. You recognize and remember the argument, argumentative prayer he had when he said, Lord, if you find 50 there, will you spare? He said, yes, I find 50. He said, well, how about 45 or how about 40? And it got all the way down to 10 in his intercession for Lot and his family and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, chapter 19, we deal with uh, the outcome of that prayer. As you know, they did not find 10 righteous people in Sodom. Chapter 18, and two angels appear, appear to Abraham along with the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 19, we only have the appearance of these two angels. And it says in verse 1, Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please, let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. Then they said, This one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city? Take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out, and he spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law he seemed to be joking. And then when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife, your two daughters, who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, Please, no, my lords. Indeed now, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil over, 
take me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground? But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. Now here we have the recording of D-Day for Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities of the plain. And when we look at this passage of Scripture, we recognize that the overriding problem that existed in this city and in these cities had to do with a moral issue an immoral issue that was being practiced by not only the citizens of these cities, but it was acceptable by those who sat at the gate. And the Lord had heard the cry long enough, and this became, we could say, the straw that finally broke the back. This was that final phase in the death of a city and of cities. And when we look at history, when we look back at the, at the great empires of our history past, we realize that there are certain characteristics that led to the fall of nations, when nations die. Now I want to share with you a little bit very quickly on this matter of when, when nations die. This is written by Kirby Anderson of Pro Ministry, and he quotes Jim Nelson Black, who wrote the book, When Nations Die. And listen to what he said. As I have looked back across the ruins and landmarks of antiquity, I have been stunned by the parallels between those societies and our own. For most of us, the destruction of Carthage, the rise of the Greek city-states, and the fall of Rome are mere ghosts of the past, history lessons long forgotten. And such things as the capture of Constantinople, the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire, the collapse of the kingdoms of France and Spain, and the slow withering decline of the British Empire are much less clear and less memorable. Most of us do not remember much from our history lessons about the French Enlightenment, or for that matter, the issues that led to the American Revolution. But this is the legitimate background of our own place in history. It is vital that we reconsider the nature of life in those earlier times. For within those eras and movements are the seeds of the troubles we face today. He goes on and breaks down the phases of a nation's decline. The phases of a nation's dying away. Historian Will Durant said, there is, no, there is no significant example in history before our time of a society successfully maintaining moral life without the aid of religion. Every nation and empire that has fallen fell in the realm of getting away from those things that brought them together in the realm of their traditions, in the realm of their religions. Now in this book, When Nations Die, he lists three aspects of decay that happen in a nation. Social decay, cultural decay, and moral decay. Tonight we're gonna look at that third one. That third phase, moral decay, is the final phase of a nation's decline, a nation's demise, and a nation's dying. Now let's just quickly notice these other two though. First of all, he says there will be a social decay. That is, 
There is a crisis of lawlessness, a loss of economic discipline, and rising bureaucracy. Listen to these words. In ancient Greece, the first symptoms of disorder were a general loss of respect for tradition and the degradation of the young. Among the early symptoms was the decline of art and entertainment. The philosophers and pundits distorted the medium of communication. Rhetoric became combative and intolerant. Intellectuals began to deride and attack all the traditional institution of Hellenistic society. That first phase, social decay, we look at that as our nation, we recognize that we have already reached that phase. The second decay, he says, is cultural decay. He says this includes the decline of education, the weakening of cultural foundations, the loss of respect for tradition, and an increase in materialism. Listen to the days of Rome. The Roman Republic historian uh, Polybus wrote that this preoccupation with luxury led to carnal indulgences. And I quote, For some young men indulged in affairs with boys, others in affairs with courtesans. They paid roughly a thousand dollars for a boy who would be bought for sexual immorality and 300 drachma for a jar of caviar. Marcus Cato was outraged by this and in a speech to the people complained that one might be quite convinced of the decline of the Republic when pretty boys cost more than fields and jars of caviar cost more than plowmen. Cultural decay. Thirdly, he said the third phase of a nation's death is moral decay. Now what does this include? It includes the rise of immortality, immorality, a, dec a decay of religious belief, and a devaluing of human life. In the decline and fall of the Roman Empire that was written by the English historian Edward Gibbon, he wrote these words. It is observed that the leaders of the empire gave in to the vices of strangers, morals collapsed, laws became oppressive, and the abuse of power made the nation vulnerable to the barbarian hordes. The British historian Catherine Edwards wrote these words. In the study of the politics of immorality in ancient Rome, she says that contraception, abortion, and exposure were common ways to prevent childbirth in Rome. Husbands refused to recognize any child that they did not believe to be their own. Until accepted by its father, a Roman baby did not legally speaking exist. Now what does that speak of? That speaks of the devaluing of life. In our nation, we have devalued life. And that is seen by the 50 million plus babies that have been aborted in America. But then he goes on. Listen to these words. Life became cheap in the latter days of the Roman Empire. Burdensome regulation and taxation made manufacturing and trade unprofitable. Eventually, children were seen as, as a needless burden, and abortion and infanticide became commonplaces. In some cases, children were even sold into slavery. And then Justinian wrote these words under, or excuse me, it was written under Justinian, in it, entertainment grew bodier, bodier, and more bizarre. Orgies and love feasts were common. Homosexuality and bestiality were openly practiced. And then he goes on to write, In Greece, the music of the young people became wild and coarse. Popular entertainment was brutal and vulgar. Promiscuity, homosexuality, and drunkenness became a daily part of life, and all moral and social restraints were lost, leading to this great decadence. Now tonight, we're going to look at that final phase, that final phase, uh, and the final part of that final phase of a nation's decline, and that is in the realm of its moral decline, its moral decay. The final phase, as many historians have written about it, it was interesting, I was reading one, and a gentleman was trying to grapple with how this all came together. He studied 12 major uh, historical writings about the decline of nations. And here's what he found. He found that they all came together, that there were seven specific phases that a nation goes through, and the final one 
the final one of all of these nations dying was in the realm of homosexuality. In Genesis chapter 19, we are introduced to a time in which God makes it clear concerning his view of this matter of homosexuality. Tonight, I want us to see a biblical response to this matter. I want us to see what does the Bible say? What do they say? And what is our response? In 1991, L.A. Law featured two women kissing on primetime TV. That same year, Northern Exposure featured a lighthearted episode in which two men married. This was then followed by Roseanne, who receiving its highest ratings when she is kissed by another woman. And then Entertainment Denied, in discussing this episode, posed the question, why is this newsworthy? When we look at that today, we recognize that is totally commonplace. In the entertainment industry of our nation, that, that doesn't even shock people anymore. The late, early 90s, that was, a, that was like a, 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 an, an earthquake erupting. That was like a, 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 a seismic eruption that was going on. And, and the interesting thing, as we have seen in the past few years, uh, in, in the response to the acceptance of homosexuality has gone from the entertainment industry to now the athletic world. It was just a few years ago that we were hearing on all the talk shows concerning Michael Sam, who came out before the NFL draft and made it known that he was a practicing homosexual. Not long after that, the NBA got in on the scene. Jason Collins, recently signed by the Brooklyn Nets, came out to declare publicly that he too was a homosexual. We have moved from the phase of the entertainment industry into the athletic industry of the acceptability of this lifestyle. Now, here's the thing that's interesting. These events that took place in the 90s were all part of a plan promoted by two men, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madden. In 1989, with the release of their book entitled After the Ball, how America will conquer its fear and hatred for gays in the 90s. The plan was to emphasize homosexuality as a civil rights issue, push the victim button on the matter, portray anyone who spoke against homosexuality as homophobic, racist, backwards, and non-intellectual, and to ultimately proclaim that being homosexual is as normal as being heterosexual. 25 years later, we see that their plan has been unbelievably successful. The media, entertainment, the political world, the military, academia, and now athletics have accepted their claims as with open arms, not questioning anything that they promoted, and no intolerance at all. The only thing left will be a greater domination in the religious world, where any message like the one you're going to hear tonight will be labeled as hate speech and eventually punishable. And we know that it's already hit the religious world. We know there are denominations that no longer grapple over the idea of ordaining men to the ministry who are homosexuals. That is already a common practice in many of our denominations. And so now they have literally touched every aspect of our society. What is needed is a biblical response. Tragically, we no longer possess a biblical presupposition that shapes our worldview. This is where, as Christians, we are failing today. We do not have a biblical presupposition. We say, what does that mean? It means that we interpret everything that goes on in culture and in society and in the world 
from a foundational and a presupposition that is biblical. We go to the Bible first is what that means. We don't go by tradition. We don't go by experience. We don't go by what's accepted in society. We say we will find out what does the Word of God say and therefore we interpret what the culture is doing from that. Sadly, today we're a very biblically illiterate church. Uh, in this age, of uh, the church age, 23% of Christians never, ever read their Bible. Experience and feelings have become the prominent presupposition that shapes our worldview today. What has been accepted for 2,000 years, if believed today, is seen as immoral bigotry. Those who affirm as moral what has been biblically and historically immoral, including homosexuality and heterosexual relations outside of marriage, are now seen as taking the moral high ground. They have totally turned it upside down. And now they are the people of virtue because the central virtue is tolerance. So what do we do? Well, number one, we find out what does the Bible say. In December of 2012, a pro-homosexual group published their own Bible or their own Bible translation. And it was dubbed the Queen James Bible. The heading of the Bible said it was a reinterpretation of the scriptures dealing with homosexuality. Now there are several passages that they dealt with. One is the chapter we just read. They also dealt with Genesis chapter 18. If you remember last uh, few weeks ago, Genesis 18 verse 20, uh, let me read to you again. It said, And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave. Chapter 19, verse 5, as we just read, it says, And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to us, to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may, and listen to the word, that we may know them carnally. Now, here's what the new version says that this means. They said, when you come to that passage of Scripture, the problem is that Lot and these angels were not being hospitable. They were not being hospitable. Uh, the problem was not homosexuality. The problem was not that God was, going, was condemning them over not uh, about being homosexual, the judgment was coming because they were not being hospitable. And they interpret these words, no, as meaning inhospitable. Well, the problem with that is, is that when you look at this word in its context, it's used 12 times in Genesis, 10 of the 12 times, it literally means to have intercourse with, to have relationships with. The context of this also reveals that the foolish, ignorant way they translate that cannot fit. Because what is it that Lot offers in response to their demand of these two angels that appear? He goes outside the door. Just imagine this. I, I can't even comprehend this. And he says to these, these foaming at the mouth, uh, overcome with, with such lustful desires that they're ready to break the door down to know these two strangers who showed up and he offered to them, he offers to them his two daughters. He said, instead of, instead of get, having them, hey, I'm just, I'll give you my two daughters who have never had any relations. Folks, when we look at Genesis 18 and Genesis 19, we realize that it is very clear that what the scripture is talking about is a lifestyle and an activity of homosexuality. It has nothing to do with hospitality. And even Jude, in verse 7, comments on this very passage of scripture and describes the sin as gross immorality and goings after strange flesh, which is a reference to homosexuality. 
You see, the sin of Sodom was not a sin of not being hospitable. The sin of Sodom was homosexuality. Homosexuality, okay? There's the first word. Now, let's go to Leviticus. In Leviticus chapter 18, you going to follow me there? Leviticus chapter 18, we see the Word of God speaking to this very matter. In Leviticus 18, verse 22, the Bible says this, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Now let's look at what it says in Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And when you go to the Queen James Version of the Bible, homosexual translation says that this is to be taken in the context of pagan idol worship. They have added the words in these two verses. They've added these words in the temple of Molech. Now, here's what they're saying. And let me just say this. There, there's no textual evidence that supports adding those words. They're not found in any Hebrew manuscript. So it, it doesn't matter to them. So, so they just added this. Now, why did they add that? What they're saying is, is that this lifestyle and activity is only forbidden when it's associated with pagan rituals. Well, there's a problem. <laughs> because if you study Leviticus 18 and 20, it also lists other prohibited behaviors for the Israelites, which included incest, bestiality, and child sacrifice. So if you're going to be truthful to the context that, well, this sin is acceptable or this lifestyle is acceptable as long as it's not associated with pagan rituals, then that means that Everything else is acceptable as long as it's not associated with some pagan ritual. So we see their explanation falls short. The scriptures are clear that homosexuality is an abomination before God. Then we go to Romans. We get to Romans and we really get some interesting feedback from the other side. In Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, the Bible is very clear concerning this particular activity. And in Romans verse, chapter 1, verse 26, it says this, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Now, if we had time to break this down, the Greek words here, it is, it is basically painting a picture of homosexuality as one of the most addictive sins that a human being can get involved in. When it talks about burning in themselves, that's a word that you don't find anywhere else for sin associated with a certain type of sin. I want to tell you, this is a sin. This is a sin that takes over. This is a sin that burns, and the lust of it is unlike any, any addiction of any other kind of sin that humanity has ever entered into. And what we have here is a very pointed word on God's judgment concerning homosexuality. In verse 32, Paul goes on to, uh, to condemn those who not only practice them. Listen to this. Read verse 32 with me. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice, who participate in them, who do it, who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, you know what that's saying? It is saying, Paul is saying, this sin is so atrocious that it's not only the ones who are active in it, but it is the ones who approve of it that are in danger of serious consequence. That's what he says in verse 32. Well, how does the translation deal with this very pointed passage? Well, John Shelby Sponge, 
retired bishop of the Episcopal Church, attempts to damage the Apostle Paul's credibility and characterizes these statements that he makes here on homosexuality as something other than the Word of God. So how do you get around it? You just say, well, that's not really the Word of God. And then he goes on to say this. Now just listen to this. Yes, I am convinced that Paul of Tarsus was a gay man, deeply repressed, self-loathing, rigid in denial, bound by the law that he hoped could keep this thing that he judged to be so unacceptable, totally under control. A control so profound that even Paul did not have to face this fact about himself. But repression kills. It kills the repressed one, and sometimes the defensive anger found in the repressed one also kill those who challenge or threaten or live out the thing that this repressed person so deeply fears. So in his view, Paul was repressing homosexual desires. Well, he was asked in an interview by some Bible-believing folks, how he could so easily dismiss the Bible's word on homosexuality. Here's what he said. And this is something you need to, you need to realize. <laughs> I don't see the Bible as the word of God. Well, <laughs> there you go. That's just the cure-all for it all. I don't see the Bible as the word of God. I see the word of God as that which I hear through the words of the Bible. There's a very big difference. Yes, there is a big difference. <laughs> I want to tell you, folks, that is a difference between the orthodox Christian view of Scripture as being God-breathed and Sponge's heretical view that accord divine authority to his own thoughts. That's the difference. <laughs> That's why he's able to come across and say that Paul was a gay man who was just repressing his feeling by coming across so harsh in this passage. And I want to tell you what Paul does. Paul condemns it in the context of idolatry. Now let's just jump on over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. And listen to what the scripture says here. Paul, I guess, is still repressing because he does not give in to this serious matter. In verse 10, it says this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and uh, verse 9 and 10. Er, oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong book. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 9 and 10. No, excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter... No, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 and 10. Now listen to what he says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That's a pretty bold statement. And then look what he does. He goes on further. He gets specific. He said, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And he uses two words in that. Homosexuals, and then translation here, sodomites, which also is translated effeminate. Here he lists homosexuality with a group of sins that will keep one out of the kingdom of God. You say, can Christians, can we be guilty of committing those sins? Yes, we can. But we will not be guilty of practicing those sins. If it's a practice of your lifestyle of, of these sins, that's a sign that you're lost. You, you, can't, you can't practice sin continuously because, like we said before, if, you, if you're really saved, God will take you out. But if you, if, you, if you linger on, that's a pretty good sign that you probably don't belong to him. No, he is saying here, you cannot practice these th sins and inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he uses two words. One word he uses is effeminate. It means, it's the Greek word malakos. It means passive, the soft one, meaning the one who is the female in the relationship. In homosexual relationship, that's how it is. One is the soft one. One plays the, basically is like the female. And then the homosexual, the word there is arsenicoitus, which means the dominant one, the active one. 
Paul is making it very clear that this is in the list of God's most dreadful sins. We'd do well to look at those others too, wouldn't we? Fornicators, adulterers, idolaters, covetous, drunkards, extortioners. But let's not overlook homosexual, homosexuality. He goes on to say in verse 11, and such were some of you. That means there's hope. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And then we go to one last passage, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 10. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 10. Writing to young Timothy, he says, concerning these matters, he says, For fornicators, sodomites, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, and if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. What is he talking about there? He's talking about those who had, had resisted, had resisted the grace of God, they fall into that category of the ungodly and sinners. Uh, these are people that needed salvation. They needed transformation, and they're included. And what does God say, and what is His view? Well, it seems to me that God speaks and shows that His desire is that we live life to the full, and to do that, He clearly gives us guidelines on sexual relations. His voice, God's voice, and, and we're, the Word is His voice. His voice is that homosexuality is not an alternate lifestyle. It is a sin in the eyes of God. His voice is not unclear. His voice is not ambiguous. It is clear to us where God stands on this matter. And let us remember, let us remember though, that his view on homosexuality is different than his view on homo, homosexuals. There's a difference. But let us not be drawn into this loving the sinner and hating the sin, because I want to tell you what most Christians do. We love the sinner and we accept the sin. We don't do what we say. Oh, you got to love the sinner and hate the sin. No, we don't. We love the sinner. We'll make excuses for the sinner. We will pardon the sinner. Uh, we, we will say there's a plan B for the sinner. We won't ever confront about the sin, and we accept the sin. That's not God's view. God doesn't play games with this matter of sin, but what the Bible says. Now, real quickly, what do the pro-homosexual groups tell us? Number one, they tell us that they were born gay. They were born gay. Ann Lander said it. And millions of people believe it. Here's the problem. There is no data that supports it. You never heard that. We just, we just, oh, well, no, no. They said that you, you can be born gay. There's no, there's no data. There's no data that supports it. Simon LeVay, a neuroscientist at the Salk Institute, argued that homosexuals and heterosexuals have notable difference in the structure of their brains. In 1991, he studied 41 bodies and found that a specific portion of the hypothalamus, the area governing sexual activity, was consistently smaller in homosexuals than heterosexuals. And he argued that this is the proof that you can be born gay. Well, here's the problem. There was a considerable range in the size of the hypothalamic region. In a few homosexual men, the region was the same size as heterosexuals. And in a few heterosexuals, the region was as small as that of a homosexual. And this presents the big question. Is the difference a result of sexual orientation or is it the cause? An example would be a blind person. Do you realize that a blind person, when they learn how to read Braille, the, the, the area of the brain that controls the reading finger actually grows bigger in the brain as they use that finger. And so that presented a problem. Could it be 
that the result of these differences is a result of their orientation and they're basically breaking the clear teachings of God's plan and word. Well, later, the same man, LeVay, admitted, admitted he wasn't sure of the sexual leaning of some of them and even raised doubts to his research. Also, LeVay's partner died of AIDS, and he stated that if he failed to find a genetic cause for homosexuality, he would walk away from science. Today, he owns and operates a small center in West Hollywood for homosexuals. He walked away from science. Well, you know what that means? He could not, he couldn't find a genetic link. There is no genetic link. There is no evidence that says a person is born gay. Number two, Michael Bailey and Richard Pillard published a study of homosexuality in twins. Of those, of those who had identical twin brothers, 50 per, 52% were homosexuals. Of those who had fraternal twins, 22% were homosexual, and only 11% who had an adopted sibling said the adopted brother was homosexual. Well, the problem was this. Number one, the theory that they promoted was not new. It was first proposed in 1952, and since then, three other studies came to a very different conclusion. The issue is why aren't all identical twin brothers of homosexuals also homosexual? If biology is determinative, why are nearly half the identical twins not homosexual? Dr. Bailey then had to go on and admit there must be something in the environment that determines this decision. And that's precisely the point. There is something in the environment that explains sexual orientation. Number three, the gay gene theory. In 1993, research by Dr. Dean Hammer, a homosexual, claimed to have found a specific genetic link to male homosexuality in the chromosomal region XQ28. The problems involve this. The findings involved a very limited sample size, 76 homosexual males. And even these samples were sketchy. He went on to admit it was a preliminary finding. There had been no control testing done for heterosexual brothers. There was a lack of research on the social histories of the families. Later on, clinical neuro, uh, neurologists George Rice and George Ebersov of Canada's University of Western Ontario failed to find a link between male homosexuality and chromosomal region XQ28. Their research was supported by work at the University of Chicago, which according to Science Magazine, does not provide strong support for a linkage at all. Rice said, evidence suggests that there, if there is a linkage, it is so weak that it is not even important. Hammer then conceded that the new studies, uh, that the new studies do indicate that at least some homosexuals are not linked to the X chromosome. Homosexual activ activists downplayed the new re research, and David M. Smith, speaking for Human Rights Campaign, which is a homosexual rights political organization, told the Washington Post, in the final analysis, it shouldn't matter whether there is a biological basis or there is not. Bottom line is, there's not. And, and they, they, that's all a front. You see, all of these things that they have proposed to our culture has only been to cause us to accept as fact things that are theories, that are false. Born gay, genetic links. All of these things are just to cause an acceptance in society that you know what? They can't help it. They can't help it. And I know that's what the Bible says, but they can't help it. They were born that way. There, there's a genetic issue going on. But the truth of the matter is, all of that was false. It was fake news to the max. There's no evidence that supported any of that. That's like the 10% claim for years and years of the idea that 10% uh, of, of our population is homosexual. Well, 
that claim has been as high as 10 to 47 percent. In 1948, Dr. Alfred Kinsey, in his research and book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, and studying all of these different things, uh, and it came out to be a bunch of uh, lies and, 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 and uh, making up uh, different types of evidence, the figure probably is closer to 2 to 3 percent. The last thing that we now hear today is that this is a civil right. And that one thing has turned our nation on its heel. The use of legal arguments developed by, from the civil rights movement to their advantage. They now argue they should be declared a protective class. This has happened and now it's led to inclusion in the United States military. It has led to same-sex marriage. It has led to the striking down of state laws that did not recognize same-sex marriage. And the thing we need to realize in confronting that is, is that same-sex marriage is not a right. Marriage has always discriminated in our history of the nation when it comes to age, marital status, and gender, including a close of kin. And, and, and the reason, uh, the homosexuality, we need to see the reason why it's not a right is homosexuality is not an immutable characteristic. It's not like a man that's born with black skin. He can't help that. A person who claimed to be a homosexual, a homosexual has made the choice to enter into that lifestyle. It is not something that they cannot change. The breakdown here will lead to the approval of polygamy. It will eventually lead to people marrying their pets. It will lead people marrying their own children, possibly for tax and inheritance issues. The argument for legalization of same-sex marriage fails in terms of any constitutional logic that our nation's founders have conceived. As Christians, we cannot accept such arguments because an even greater authority, the authority of the Bible as the Word of God, binds us. Even Jesus in Matthew 19, verses 4 and 6, exclaimed that God intended marriage as the union of one man and one woman. And there's no argument. Now what we must do, and what shall we do? Number one, we need to remember God stands firm on homosexuality. There's no argument here, folks. A Christian who says that God accepts homosexuality is a complete moron. Ignorant. That's what the word means. They're ignorant. It means they don't read their Bible. It means they have not studied their Bible. To say that shows the ignorance of that person. And it's showing that they're not basing it on what they know of the Bible. They're just basing it on what they believe God is. They're basing it on their feeling. They're basing it on experience. They're basing it on because they've got a family member that's a homosexual. They've got a friend that's a homosexual. And they just want to know that God accepts them as a homosexual. He doesn't. He doesn't. But God's love for the homosexual is redemptive. He hates the sin of homosexuality. But his love for the homosexual is redemptive in nature. And that means that we must remain anchored in truth. We must remain anchored in truth. You see, the problem with sin and with homosexuality is that it is a sin problem. We all have a gene problem. When I hear somebody say it's related to genetics, our sin problem is related to genetics. It's related to Adam. He sinned, and we inherited his gene problem. It's a sin problem. We have a tendency to rebel against God. When God said, this is what the family unit will look like, this is how it will function, this is how it will be, what do we as humans do? We rebel against it. Like telling a kid, don't touch, they're going to touch. <laughs> you know, don't take, they're going to take. The flight from moral responsibility has become the hallmark of our modern age. The Bible will not allow for this evasion. Our sinful behavior rooted in biology or not is a matter for which we are 
fully accountable. Ambro the Milan lived in the years 340 to 397, said this, Before we are born, we are infected with the contagion, and before we see the light of day, we experience the injury of our origin. He was saying we were born with the sin nature. Scientific evidence is not morally important, though it may be medical, medically useful. The church's witness to the biblical condemnation of homosexuality as sin is a crucial test of faithfulness no matter where the biological research may lead. The church must take its stand on the Word of God and leave the genes to the gen geneticists. We need to realize God has spoken clearly. God has spoken clearly. Science will catch up with the Word. History, uh, archaeology always catches up with the Word. Science will catch up with the word. Number two, we must lovingly yet firmly respond to the aggressive agenda to many that are in the homosexual community. I want to tell you, this is a powerful, aggressive movement that has basically been accepted as a norm in our society. Folks, we must not let the homosexual activists silence us in speaking the truth of the word of God. You say, that, that may be costly. It will. It will be costly. But we cannot. We cannot back down from the Word of God. We don't get along. We don't just come along and let's just get along and let's just accept and love everybody. Folks, that's not the answer. That's like you having the cure for cancer and saying to my brother-in-law, Oh, I just hope things go well. You know, I don't think I'm going to tell him about the cure I've got here. Good luck. You know, good. Hope, hope you have a wonderful day. And we don't give them the answer. And we just accept homosexuality as a norm, as something God, God accepts, we are doing an injustice to the soul of those that have been trapped by this very powerful addiction. Number three, we must understand the desperation of those that are in the homosexual movement and lifestyle. See, pain resides in the heart of those who are addicted to it I believe if you really break Romans down, it could be the greatest addiction of all. Folks say heroin. Heroin is, a, is an unbelievable, powerful addiction. I believe homosexuality is greater. I believe homosexuality is possibly the most powerful addiction uh, that, that touches humanity. Number four, we must extend hope to them. The only way out is the way up. The healing, redemptive power of Jesus Christ is sufficient. We must remember what Jesus did and said to the woman who was about to be stoned. As he reached down to her and showed her loving kindness and showed her grace, he said to that woman, I do not condemn you. That seemed to be the, the, the message of the church today concerning homosexual and homosexuality. We do not condemn you. And we stop there. We've done it injustice. We've done an injustice. When we accept it, when we stop there, we've done an injustice because Jesus did not say to that woman about to be stoned, I do not condemn you and walked away. He said, I do not condemn you, but go and sin no more. He didn't say, oh, it's okay, honey. You just go live in adultery. Go get you some more men and, and just make you some more money in that lifestyle. He said, I don't condemn you but don't go and sin again. Sin no more. It is not easy to change for folks that are caught up in this lifestyle, but I want to tell you it's possible. It is possible. And we must not budge on the standard. We accept all <laughs> that they can be saved, but we don't accept all if they live in sin. Let me ask you this question. Why is it that we've got churches today that are turning a blind eye to the matter of homosexuality who would not turn a blind eye if somebody came in and said, my husband is beating me every night. I'm married to a wife beater. We'd take action, wouldn't we? We'd call the, we'd call the legal authorities. We'd, we'd find a safe haven for that woman. We would try to do everything we could to, to save her from that. 
If we had somebody to come in and, 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 and they shared with you that uh, my, my family is, is, is abusing me. If we had someone to come in and said uh, uh, that I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pedophile and, and I'm active in that, in that and, I, and I'm not going to stop. We, we wouldn't just accept them and say, oh, that's okay. We, we love you anyway. We love you in spite of it. I don't believe there's any woman here that would put up with her husband being a consistent, active ad- adulterer. They say, oh, honey, I love you anyway. You just do what you got to do. You can't help it. You were born that way. You just, you just keep doing what you got to do. And, and I love you anyway. I love you in spite of it. Unless that woman had something wrong with her mentally, she'd sit down and say, no, I'm not going to be a part of that, that lifestyle. You're not bringing that in here. We would not accept those matters. And therefore, we must hold the standard high and reach out, reach out even though everything else on the other side is saying that we're bigoted and that we are ignorant and that we are not in touch with the time. I'm going to tell you something about Jesus. The Bible says he is full of grace and truth. He is full of grace and truth. And we must not neglect either. He is full of grace, oh yes, but he is also full of truth. And Jesus never made an exception when it came to the clear teachings of God's Old Covenant and Old Testament. He's full of grace and truth. And we must stand there. You're going to go to work. You're going to go to school. And it's going to be shoved down your throat. That you've got to accept it. That our kids have to sit under it. But I think it's time as Christians that we say up, stand up and say, listen, this is wrong. This is wrong. You say, that's going to be costly. I tell you, folks, it's costly to stand on the Word of God. While we are so backpedaling and backing down to every little sin desire of humanity that's coming down the pike, the church is retreating. And Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We need to get the gates up. We need to stand with the gates. And we need to proclaim in love the truth of God's Word. Because we're not helping them. And I want to tell you, they are leading our nation. They're leading our nation to its demise. The final, final phase of the death of a nation, of empires, goes back to that moral decay. Everyone, when they began to fall in the realm of immorality, especially in the realm of homosexuality, it wasn't long till they were conquered and they were completely wiped out. It's scary to see where we are. Let's take the stand. Stand for truth. Speak the truth in love. Loving the sinner. But folks, we need to do a better job of hating the sin. Of confronting the sin. Of speaking the truth to individuals. Because they are living in a lie. They believe everything that I just showed you had no evidence. I was born gay, I've got a genetic gene, all of these other things that have been promoted. Not one shred of evidence for any of it. And every single individual that tried to promote it was doing it, was doing it for their own benefit because they were caught up in the very lifestyle that they wanted to legitimize. It's time that we speak the truth. It's time that we reach those who are homosexuals We go to them with the gospel and we deliver them just like those that were saved at Corinth when he said, and such were some of you. Not still are, were some of you. Well, let's pray.